Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Lord. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the presentation. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Larrakia people, traditional owners of this country. Um, also, for any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room, that it is possible that some of the images in here are of deceased peoples. Um, my name's Bo Khan. It's Robert. This is my real name. Everyone calls me Bo. I'm the third of six children. I'm Bardi and Jabba Jabba person. My name in Bardi is Ejai. I'm also got links to the NT. Um, and its names are Ware, uh, Gujuk, and Guruduru, which is the black shark. So look out. Um, so I'm going to be talking about governance, good governance, First Nations, but specifically related to fisheries enterprises. Um, so I'll go through this in, in that order. There's a lot more slides than what's saying on that list there. Um, but basically, I was born and bred in Darwin and educated here in my year 12 at Casuarina High School um, and done every job you can probably think of, everything from here as a 17-year-old at the farm domesticating buffalo, also doing crocodile catching back in the day, mowing lords, lawns, mopping Woolworths, um, so I've done a lot. And here I am after being a school teacher for three years, then had an opportunity to join fisheries and been here since 2000. So as I said, this, it's about governance, but it's really also about the leadership and, and trying to link all of this with fishing. So where this has come from is um, we've, we've been consulting with traditional owners in East Arnhem about getting more average people in the fishing industry. And a lot of discussion came about leadership in the region, um, ownership by the traditional owners and more control over that. And, and that all led to governance. And this is the dictionary term of what governance is. I'd like to sway you during this presentation what I think governance is. So I undertook a trip last year funded by the Fisheries Research Development Corporation. It was an Indigenous scholarship. And I went to northern New South Wales to have a look at their fishing cooperatives. Um, and it was really about how a variety of different fishermen can actually come together under one structure while still competing with each other. And over here, this is Clarence River. John Harrison from the Professional Fishermen's Association took me around. And what I got to see was was these family groups. And if you look at the, the boat and the car there, so that's two brothers own the car and the boat. And that, they fish as one section of river. They've been fishing that section of river for generations. And there's a number of other fishermen with similar, all the boats are very similar. Um, the cars are a little different, but there's brothers, there's individuals, but they all have one section that they've been fishing for generations. What they do is they pull all their fish and they bring it into this one location, which is the Clarence River Fishing Cooperative. And you'll see on there the boxes there. So they've got little barcodes on there. So each fisherman's identified by the barcode. So their product can be quality tested and then it's weighed. And then the cooperative determines how much that fisherman gets for that, but also keeps track just by a simple scanning what fishermen are bringing in and how much they'll get paid for it. The main thing that the fishermen like about this is that they're guaranteed that the co-op's going to buy their product. So this is the shop front of the Clarence River Fishing Cooperative. So they've even got a little takeaway shop there, uh, but you can go in and buy the fresh seafood straight from the floor. Um, there's also uh, place there you can see on there where they bring the fish in and they weigh it on here 
and then there's the computer there with the little scanner, and that's where they understand which fishermen are bringing what product in. So you'll see down here, this is some of the key messages that I've, I've asked everyone that I spoke to to give me some take-home messages. I won't necessarily read them all out. Some of them I will read out during the presentation though. So while I was in the area, I went up to Coffs Harbour as well and had a look at their fishing co-op. So that's more the, um, rather than being in the river, that's more of the offshore stuff. And you can see here the boats are a bit bigger, but again, it's still, a lot of them are family owned businesses. Some own one boat, some have got a couple of boats. But the, and one of the key messages in this one, as you can see there, was about remaining loyal to your governance framework to make sure we've got a sustainable business. And the purpose on that is sometimes the fishermen uh, can be enticed to go outside of the governance or outside of this cooperative structure where they're offered a lot more money for their product. But when they step outside of that, it, once they don't produce that product to that buyer, the buyer then goes to somebody else. They've got no loyalty to that fisherman. So then the fisherman's left high and dry if they can't, then they've got to try and find somebody else. Whereas in this structure, they're guaranteed to sell their product to the co-op. And one of the incentives as well for good quality and providing enough product through the door is that every, every individual member on the co-op is also a shareholder. So again, this is this is inside the shop. This is in one shop itself. So you can buy your fresh seafood on the left there, pick what you want, and then take it over to the right side and tell them how you want it cooked. This was the only photo I have of Dina, who helped me out over in British Columbia. She's from the First Nation Fisheries Council. Um, and basically, this council represents 203 First Nations with, from 14 regions within British Columbia. They've set this up because they needed, they basically needed to have a united voice. And it was m more about dealing with government and ensuring that they, were, that they had their ceremonial, cultural, um, and also commercial opportunities with the fish stocks. This is the traditional owners for Vancouver, the Musqueam tribe. So I went and had a look at the tribal council there, met some of the members. So they've got 11 council members, and I'll show you on the next slide. But the young fellow in the white shirt there is Richard Sparrow. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Sparrow case. That was a pretty major case. Sparrow versus DFO, the Department of Fisheries Oceans. Um, and it was all about Aboriginal fishing rights in Canada. So this is this is Richard Sparrow. His his grandfather was the one who won that case. So he's the young chief here. So apologies for the R dropping off. It did that when we changed the system over. But basically, they have a chief in council, and they're elected. So there's 11 council members representing their families. There's also, and they've also got a, a specific fisheries committee. So the people I was talking to in the previous slide, they're from that fisheries committee. Some of them, there was a technical officer there, um, but the young Richard Sparrow, he's on the fisheries committee. And part of their part of their business is that they talk very regularly to the broader Aboriginal community there. They'll have meetings every two months and bring the community in. And it's all about the way they see it. Feed them as much information as you can so there's no, no worries about people thinking there's secret business going on or being left out. But it's also providing opportunities. And it keeps the council 
fairly grounded to the community and understanding what the community needs and wants and, and directions they want to go in. So it's not just about fishing. As you can see, it's, this is out of season, so that's why there's a bit of water sitting in those boats, but that's some of the boats that um, members from the Musqueam tribe own, and that's what they go fishing in. But it's also other opportunities. So the cultural, there's a cultural centre on the left there. Um, this is the Musqueam tribal land within Vancouver. So this is their Aboriginal reserve. See the trees over there? That's a golf course. So they own a couple of golf courses as well. <laughs> they own a couple of golf courses. But one of the interesting things too is that in British Columbia, if you're an Aboriginal person living within your reserve, then you don't have to pay tax when you're when you're working. So that's the payoff about then you don't get all these benefits about health benefits or other ones. It's that you don't have you don't pay tax. So I went up to Chilliwack for a day and met with Ernie, Ernie Victor from the Lower Fraser Fishing Association. And they were very strong about cultural fishing access, being part of the management and looking at business opportunities. So they've also got a selection of chief process um, and it fits in the lower Fraser Fishing Association, it fits in within the Chilliwack Corporation. So there's a larger corporation, and again, they have the specific fisheries side of it. So that little hut there on the left, that only tells me that that would have been there for thousands of years, not particularly that hut, they would have been upgrading it over the years, but that would be owned by one family, and that's, that's where they dry their salmon. So there was a few rocks down here and you can see marks where, where they traditionally tie themselves to the rock and they scoop the fish up. Um, and again, those rocks, they'd be the same rocks that the family's been using for thousands of years. So part of the fishing, they also have a sports fishing business and that's the old fellow in the middle here, that was this boat, brand new boat, first day out on the water and I happened to be in it and it broke down. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but also I was the one who fixed it, so that's good. Um, and that's the chief here, or Ken, he looks like, a, looks like a chief, a very, very strong speaker as well. And he was all, always talking about the leadership. And just not never take the back step that you can listen to other people, take criticism, don't step backwards, always look at it moving forward. So I spent a few days heading inland in British Columbia. You see this beautiful Okanagan Lake, and I got to work with the Okanagan Nation Alliance. So again, this is another structure, very big group, and you can see how large that territory is there. Um, so Vancouver's over here, so to the left, and that's the, the orange line sort of down the bottom middle part, that's the US border, so that's Washington State through here. So basically, these guys, they've got linkages, as I said, to the US, um, but there are seven member Indian band. So when I say Indian band, I don't mean the ones that play music. It's how they refer to themselves as, as groups. And I've just given an example of one of the Indian bands, the Asois. And so with fisheries, oh, sorry, business opportunities, it's They've got camping ground, so people come and camp in these locations near the river. Um, but they also run sports fishing. And I went to, a, I had the opportunity to go to a meeting there while they had the sports fishing people there. And they also very strong on the health and social issues. 
But, you know, the key message there, success is through the strong leadership of elected members, as well as the unity of all the bands. Now, they, these guys were able to use their tribal linkages in the US because in the US side they've actually got more rights than what they have in the British Columbia side in Canada. So they used their tribal linkages in the US and were able to negotiate funding from the hydro electricity businesses and companies where they've dammed off a lot of the rivers. So it was their, their linkages over the US that they managed to get the fish to come back and it's only, um, it was only last year that was the first time that had been a number of generations before they had they'd seen any salmon come back into their river. So it was, that was a really exciting time for these guys. But again, it was just by pushing forward. They also worked through the um, First Nation Fisheries Council and, help, and that helped secure some of these deals. So a bit more on the Okanagan. This is another group called the Shushwap. And, and the key message there that I like is about you still being able to have your own identity, but have a stronger voice at the regional level, you need to come together. The other one here that I've heard on a number of governments organisations was that you really need that legal and financial support or, or expertise there. Now in here there, I just thought I'd show this one about the branding to show that they are different to other groups in British Columbia and they've put their own branding on it, River Fresh Wild BC Salmon. Um, they've also been innovative on how they, how they prepare their product or process it. Um, this one here that this follows hard, I can't remember his name, but that's a that's Klaus Jeffrey, everyone. Um, so that that's that's called candy salmon. So it's a it's basically how they've dried it out and they've marinated it and it was quite sweet. Um, but there's all different sort of ways of smoking it, and I got a sample of that, which was yummy. So I also flew up to a place called Prince Rupert and as you can see by the snow on the mountains there, um, it was quite cold. So that white line up the sort of top left, that's actually the Alaska border right there. So I was in here and when I was sitting down having dinner that night, an old fellow was pointing to these hills and I didn't realise how close we were to Alaska. There's a group there's a couple of groups within here, um, the North, North Coast Skeena, and again, when I mentioned maintaining that individualness, so this sort of supports it when they say you can support autonomy for each clan, but you look at issues at a collect and, and have it so it's related to the collective purpose of all the groups. Also in Prince Rupert, there's a group called the National Native sorry, Brotherhood of British Columbia. Now, now this group, that, they were formed back in, I think it was 1923. Um, and what they've done was they've maintained loyalty to the Queen. And even on their logo, you can't see it there. But the old fellow there, he's got the vest on, he's got the red logo on his, over his heart. When you turn that logo upside down, it's actually the, the Queen's crown. So basically, these guys here, they, they compete just like everybody else. So they, they'll go out and compete for funding. They also go out and fight to get the voice back to government or Aboriginal fishing rights, but 
they're very much about their traditional knowledge as well and really, really making sure that all the groups maintain that. And this place, Prince Rupert, is so remote. The population of Prince Rupert is, is very similar to the NT where it's 30% Indigenous population. Um, before I get on to the Great Bear Initiative, even, even in Prince Rupert, there's another group there that I didn't put on the slide, it was too many to do, but there's a group called the Lux, Lux Um Actually, I might go back and just show you. So, the old fella down the, sitting on my right, down there, so he's on the bottom left here, Bill Shepherd, he's part of that, that Indian band, and it's the only one in British Columbia that maintained the hereditary system of chiefs. And so that's pretty incredible, and I'll go into that a little bit later too. So the Great Bear Initiative is from the Coastal Guardian Watchman Network, and it, it, was, it just came as a name from a conference, basically. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's anything about bears. But they have an alliance with nine First Nations, and the Council of Haida, which is pretty much there for British Columbia. The Haida is pretty much from Vancouver Island all the way up the coastline to Alaska. So this group here, they're really all about providing leadership around policy issues. Um, and again, the, one of the key messages there was all about how, how they maintain their strategic planning, really make sure they involve the, the board, they do it on a regular process, and they also very strong about building the capacity of the board and then helping people within the regions at the local and regional level. So, when you kind of put all this together, this is British Columbia in general, you kind of put it all together, there's, there's a whole raft of individual groups and it's all from one group like I mentioned about the Osoys Indian Band to then you've got the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations, you've got the First Nations Summit, Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs. Well, those three at the top there, they've, they've formed together, made a much more powerful voice, and they've formed the First Nations Leadership Council. And then down the bottom there is the First Nations Fisheries Council I've talked about already. And that Leadership Council at the top basically has given power back to the First Nations Fisheries Council and called it the First Nations Fisheries Society. And up under that, they've, they've signed their own declaration and protocol. Um, and basically what it says there, it looks at supporting and coordination across, across British Columbia. But it, and it's to do with advancing Aboriginal fishing rights, getting proper um, consultation, reconciliation, and all about socio-economic being part of the management side of things in fisheries matters. So, as you can see by all of that, governance is really strong, or it's viewed as a very important aspect in, in British Columbia by First Nations, so much so that they've got this handbook here that was created in 2003. Um, but and when I mentioned about that one group, the Lax Kualams up in Prince Rupert, who were the only Indian band in British Columbia that maintained the hereditary system of chiefs, what happened was in 1869 over in British Columbia, um, the government of the day made legislation to say that Indians wanting to be a group, organisation or association had to take up an election process for their chiefs. So they had to give way to their hereditary system. So they were forced by law to do that. And what, that, what's that, what that's kind of done is that even though it was over 100 years ago, it's put things right out of whack on how they're used to doing business. So they're really trying to catch up with things. And that's 
this governance handbook I had a look at that and it's got some really good statements in there um, but as I say here this is this is the view of governance from from this handbook here so it's having jurisdiction sorry that's the self-government having jurisdiction control over the political community while governance is the process by which First Nations exercise that control And for those who are wondering, before I get on to the Northwest Indian one, so they do have stuff in Australia about Indigenous governments. There's governance, there's um, trainers that are out there that specifically set up training models around Indigenous governance. We've just done one with the, with the East Arnhem leaders over there for fisheries to help set up a corporation, and that was delivered by Ambrose Business Consultancy. Um, there's also an Indigenous Governance Toolkit, an online toolkit that you can look at. Um, I know there was a report from the Social Justice Commission of Mick Gooda last year, and it was about social justice and native title, but it was really, when you read into it, it was really about governance and having good, good governance in Indigenous communities. Um, there was also I saw a report last year, there was also um, a review of Indigenous corporations around Australia and it was something like 90% were found to be non-compliant. So there has been a major change since then in Indigenous corporations and the way governance is delivered and the training and support mechanisms behind it. So over the border to the US, I went and met with the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and basically they're, they're very strong, they're, they've got a very powerful system in place because in Washington state the Indian tribes there actually own by law 50% of their whole fishery and that means even the ability to manage it, to, to allocate commercial licences and and they've got their own they've got their own management teams, so they've got scientists, they've got researchers, managers, um, the whole gamut. But they also maintain their own fishing industry. As you can see, these two old fellows just been out for the morning, come back with their catch. So They've also got, so there's 20 tribes within, within the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and they're all regarded as being their own, their own sovereign sort of nation. So the old fella here put his arm around me, Billy Frank Jr. Um, he very very lovely man, very powerful man. Um, he was showing me a photo behind, I wish I had got it in the photo, there was a photo with him and um, the US President, Barack Obama. He was really proud of that. Um, but I also saw a video with him and he was driving from the 17 year old where he used to actually go and fight with fisheries wardens before they were given the 50% fishery. So they, they fought it. On the, on the battlefield and they fought it in the courts. Um, so this is really a, a whole state, whole of state sort of government structure. And on the right, the slide on the right, sorry, on the left, myself and Alex here, that location there, there used to be a cattle ranch and the money that they get from some of their fishing businesses the tribes got together and said, we're going to start buying back our land so we own it outright. And they've bought this cattle ranch back and they've just started rehabilitating the whole area. So, my findings. I said a couple of times there about that unity, having that unity, but also maintaining the autonomy. So allowing individuals to be individuals. Um, very important about strategic planning, but 
there was one there about innovation and diversifying your businesses as well. Um, the legal and financial capacity, doing partnerships, strong leadership. My, my favourite one there, which is what I've highlighted, is ownership and, and having that collective purpose. And it's, it's, it's a, not an easy one to explain to communities in remote areas because it hasn't always been a collective purpose at a, at a community level. Aboriginal groups are family orientated. That doesn't mean they can't take that step about having that collective purpose, but it's explaining what the benefits are that but you can still maintain your your autonomy, which is again point number one. Um, but one of the strong ones which that native the native brotherhood group were talking to me about was always using your past to be able to plan for your future and, and it's having that traditional knowledge and keeping that there and knowing how you got to where you are and that helps you drive forward. But every one of them always said it was about a good functioning board. So if you could just, just imagine something here for a moment that you've got um, and I talked about it earlier, so you've got a boat, a car, two brothers getting in, they go out fishing for the day, that's the same area they've been fishing, generations, their grandfather, great grandfather been fishing there. And around the bend there's another two brothers or cousins and they're doing the same thing, they're respecting each other's boundaries, they're not going in and out, they pull all their fish product together, in one cooperative and they sell it and that's how they make their money. And if we look here, back in 1960 and in the 70s, this is exactly what was happening on, on Galawinku. They had the Galawinku Fishing Corporation. No different to this, they had something like 25 little tinnies. Individuals or brothers or cousins, brothers would go out every day Catch, catch their fish, bring it all back in, put it on the truck here, put it all iced up, and then all that product was sent into Darwin and sold. And as Terry Yumble's words here, this, it's not something that's new, that this has worked in the past, and so the project I'm working on in East Island, we're not, I'm not trying to create anything new, but I'm trying to sell messages that, that this thing, this is something that can work. And I've showed that that works today on the East Coast through Fishing Cooperative and I've showed that this can work in British Columbia and it's all about fishing. So here we are. So today, the members or people within East Arnhem, some of the leaders there, they are more informed about governance and, and relating it to seafood businesses and fisheries management. But, you know, I've looked at the, the successful operations in New South Wales, got the key messages from British Columbia and the US, we had a business consultancy, that delivered governance training to the steering committee members. And this is the steering committee members here in the fisheries conference room in April. And after doing their final or their second last governance training day, they decided that they were ready to formulate a corporation and have their governance structure. And that's when they applied to ORIC and set up the Gun Gear Fishing Aboriginal. Corporation. So many things to do in the future, I wasn't even going to write them all down. But it, it's, it's still got to be that follow up stuff on the governance. We can't just leave it there thinking that we've had a consultant come in, run the governance training, and that's the end of it. Because it's not. So, you know, I know Orica delivering. Uh, governance training in September this year over in Go. 
That hasn't even come from me. It's come from the board members telling me they want to go to that as well. I've been telling them to get on, have a look at the Indigenous Governance Toolkit online. They can get, get that on. There's, there's also groups out there or small businesses out there that deliver specific Indigenous governance, but it's all with a cultural spin on it. I'd like to be able to get some of the board members in here to have a look at the fishing co-ops in northern New South Wales and, and show them that, that what they've done in the past on Gatawinku is actually working somewhere else. That's my acknowledgement. So, the Fisheries Research Development Corporation, mainly for their funding my trip overseas, um, the vision of the Indigenous Reference Group for supporting my application, Department of Prime Ministry of Fisheries, Fisheries Division, John Harrison, who was from the Professional Fishermen's Association in New South Wales. He was one that organised my trip down there, look at the fishing co-ops. Um, Dina from the First Nation Fisheries Commission in British Columbia in Canada. And Dina had my whole schedule planned out for me um, and it was a lot of Skyping before I went. Um, Tony Mayer, again Tony did the similar thing for the US, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Um, Ambrose Business Solutions, I enjoyed participating in their governance training with the board, uh, with the steering committee members and Terry Yumbalu, who's now the chairman for Gungir Fishing Aboriginal Corporation. This has been Terry's vision for a good 25 years and he's really happy and excited to see something starting to come through here. Um, my, my role is now to try and keep him on the ground a bit because Terry's looking 20 years down the track um, but he's running that all right now, so it's good. The, the drive's there, the, initial, um, the momentum's got to keep going though. Um, and finally, I just acknowledge my partner, Shay, for putting up with me going away um, and even taking along some parts of it.